We work, we live, we innovate, and create. At the center of it all is your brain health. The ability to solve problems, think analytically, share empathy, and thrive. We're trying to make brain performance really the next fitness revolution. So how do you boost brain power? Welcome to the Brain Health Project, an urgent call to transform your mind to work stronger and faster. This is an absolute crisis as great as any we have ever faced. We have to equip the minds and brains of our citizens to cope with the accelerating, dizzying rate of change that they face in their lives. Your brain health is not fixed. Scientific discoveries prove it can adapt and grow regardless of your starting point. Our greatest value, the asset that will help us to change everything, every problem we're in, is all in our head. To harness that treasure, we must measure and monitor progress while things are going well versus waiting for an injury or disease to strike. Too many of us are outliving our brains, and that does not have to be the case. The information age is bombarding us with more content than our human brains can handle. How do you keep from getting lost in this and focus on deep thinking? For starters, stop multitasking. Science shows us that multitasking is bad for your brain. It reduces fluid intelligence, causes brain atrophy, and increases chronic stress. The global pandemic is creating more stress than ever, stress that leads to depression and anxiety and beyond. Unlocking our potential to navigate these hurdles starts with learning the right strategies, even in school. So when teachers have these strategies, they're empowered to support our learners, and then the learners are now able to take ownership of their learning. Training kids how to think is doubling academic achievement among middle schoolers. I think the greatest national security threat is pre-K through 12. If we don't take care of educating our young men and women, then we have to ask ourselves, where, where are we going to be in 20 years? Our world-renowned scientists know you can increase your brain health, not lose it. It's time for a new category of health, brain health. You are a game changer. Ready to transform the world with us? Be a part of the brain health revolution. It starts here. Hey, welcome everybody to Frontiers of Brain Health. This is our lecture series in which we take a deep dive into some of the most exciting um, areas of neuroscience and brain research. So um, I'm Dan Krawczyk. I'm the deputy director here at the center, as well as a professor in psychology at the University of Texas at Dallas. And uh, we have uh, a virtual audience as well as the in-person audience, so we'll have time for questions. Please use the um, Q&A function if you're virtual and would like to uh, have a question answered. I will save those toward the end of the talk. Um, the Center for Brain Health is a cognitive neuroscience research center. We're part of the University of Texas at Dallas, and we've dedicated the past three decades to exploring neuroplasticity, the brain's remarkable ability to change uh, in response to the environment. And uh, if you stay to the end, we'll talk about our, our break it, groundbreaking signature research study, the Brain Health Project. And our speaker is actually one of our collaborators on that project today. So uh, today we have Dr. Sven Vanesta, who is coming to us from Trinity College, Dublin. And uh, he's a professor of psychology there and was just recently appointed the chair of psychology um, at Trinity College. And his lab for clinical and integrative neuroscience, the acronym CLINT, is undertaking groundbreaking research on um, brain stimulation, but as it applies also across the lifespan and aging and disorders. Um, Sven earned his master's of psychology and criminology at Ghent University. Then he did his doctoral degree in medical sciences at the University of Antwerp. Um, before he was at Trinity College Dublin, he was here at UT Dallas with us for several years. 
And um, he was awarded an honorary professorship recently at the University of Otago in New Zealand. And just speaking from experience, um, Sven is really one of a kind. Uh, for those interested in metrics and stats, his H index is 60. And his hair is way too dark for that number. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's, he's a staggering uh, productive machine in, in science. Um, he just is, uh, is amazing. He's, he's, I, I counted over 13,000 references and citations of his work. So um, he's just been at the forefront of brain stimulation uh, for a number of years. He's one of the world experts at this point. Um, I, I feel like every time I talk to Sven, I learn something new. And it's like looking into the future, because he knows things that the rest of the field aren't going to know for like a year. So you get like this preview. <laughs> of where everything is in brain stimulation. And of course, that's central to neurotechnology and industry. So we're extremely excited to have Sven Vanesta back. Well, thank you, Dan, for the kind introduction. And Sandy, thank you, Sandy, for uh, the invitation. It's great to be back after three years. Um, so today, I want to talk about the advances in non-invasive treatments for age-related cognitive decline. So when we talk about brain stimulations, there's different types of uh, brain stimulation. We have two big categories of uh, brain stimulation. We have the invasive uh, types of brain stimulation, where, the bra where you see the brain stimulation, cortical surface uh, stimulation, vagus nerve stimulation. Are, these are all invasive techniques. On the other hand, on the right side, you have non-invasive techniques. Uh, some of you might already be familiar with transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, where you send magnetic pulses to the brain, or uh, non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation, trigeminal nerve stimulation. But today, I want to talk about transcranial electrical stimulation. Now, the interesting thing about transcranial electrical stimulation is basically two electrodes that sends current to your brain. There's now also a new setup, high definition uh, transcranial electrical stimulation, where you have more electrodes that can send electricity to your brain in a more focal and direct way. But the interesting thing about this type of device is that you also have a remote neuromodulation device. So you can actually use it at home uh, under control of uh, the physician. And this, of course, creates a lot of potential. There's no surgery involved in it. You just get trained how to apply it, and then you can take it home and uh, do the treatment. So in that sense, it's a very interesting tool to have. Now, um, transcranial electrical stimulation, or TECS, is applied for already most neurological and psychiatric uh, conditions. I think there's over 70 diverse indications or conditions that uh, people looked into to see if there's a potential for a transcranial electrical stimulation to actually use it as a treatment tool for that specific condition. It's a lot. And my feeling is a little bit that there's some people that have a list of all neurological and psychiatric conditions, and it's just a checkbox. OK, this one we're done. Next one, next one, next one. So it's a little bit concerning also. So um, here you see uh, just electrical stimulation. And actually, the red is indicating where the current is going to. This is uh, HD, TD, uh, HD transcranial electrical stimulation. And you can see that the stimulation is a little bit more focal. But it's like it's a magic tool. It helps with so many conditions that some people were a little bit uh, concerning and became very critical. So there was a really important paper that came out in 2018 by Buzaki and his group at NYU that was actually saying, well, probably it's too good to be true. And he tested, is it actually true that those two electrodes that you put on your head, is it actually activating the brain in a systematic way? And he did a post-mortem study implanted uh, that person that passed away with several electrodes and stimulated the brain using transcranial electrical stimulation. And actually, he showed that not a lot of the current was going to the brain. 
that 75% of the current was not even able to reach uh, the brain. So that started a big controversy within uh, the scientific field. Was basically all the research that was done, was it wrong? Was it just a placebo effect or not? Well, there were some studies that were done really in a solid, uh, uh, on a solid basis and really reliable basis that were showing clinical beneficial effects long term. So how can we explain that? We see these effects, but on the, uh, on the one hand, the, w uh, the way it works doesn't make any sense. Well, there was some pushback saying that, and this is in people in vivo, so people that were living, that had electrodes implanted, and they also looked at, well, if we apply current in a non-invasive way, can we pick up that signal uh, in the brain recording from those implanted electrodes? And they were actually able to show that they could pick up some of the current. Well, Bozaki was saying, well, it's because um, these people had an electrode implanted and there's a borehole and the current is basically going through that borehole into the brain. But one thing that really intrigued me is another paper that came out um, by a group in Belgium, in Louvain, by McClellan, and they were saying, well, actually, a lot of the current is not going directly to the brain, but of course we have peripheral nerves that might send indirectly that electricity to the brain. And they were able to show that in addition to a transcranial effect, so an effect where you send current directly to the brain, there's also a transcutaneous mechanism, meaning that electricity was picked up by these nerves, in this case, the trigeminal nerve, and the trigeminal nerve is basically your facial nerve, is sending all the information from your face to your brain. And he was able to show, or they were able to show that it, uh, if you apply this method, that via these nerves, you actually activate brain activity. Now, this was quite intriguing to me, and I was thinking, well, we have the trigeminal nerve, which is a well-known cranial nerve, but there's also another nerve, and that's the greater occipital nerve. It's basically, that's this yellow nerve. It's a nerve on the back of your head. So if you basically lay down, and you're aware that you're laying down, you feel your pillow, that's actually your occipital nerve that sends information to your brain. Now, that's a very superficial nerve. It's very easy to reach. It's very easy to activate. So that got me thinking. And I started digging into the literature. And actually, stimulation of that specific nerve is already an existing treatment since the 80s. They use it for cluster headache. They use it for migraine, for people with severe migraine attacks. And they implant people uh, with those conditions, putting two electrodes, one on the left and one on the right side, stimulating that nerve. And it seems to be very helpful for people with migraine and uh, cluster headache. Now, we did the same thing, and it ba was basically serendipity. We had one patient that we implanted because they were complaining about migraine and cluster headache, but that patient also had fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is bodily spread pain, so uh, has very dif uh, people have very difficulty, uh, have difficulties uh, standing up in the morning, they have muscle pain all over, uh, they have typical chronic fatigue syndrome, and so on, they have several complaints. And that patient that was actually treated for migraine also told us, oh, actually, my pain is gone, I can go back to work. And this was, of, our, of course, a light bulb for us, it was like, oh, there might be something in it. So we implanted 45 patients, and here you can see a patient with an electrode implanted that is targeting that greater occipital nerve. And uh, so it's basically, the, you have the electrode that is connected to a battery that is sending pulses to uh, that cranial nerve. And we were able to show that indeed, we can modify pain. Uh, the pain complaint, measured by the numeric rating scale, more, better known as the visual analog scale, on a scale from zero to 10, how much pain do we have, was dropping over time when we were stimulating uh, uh, the fibromyalgia impact questionnaire, how much impact that condition has was significantly dropped, and also the pain visual and, and awareness questionnaire, how emotional distress are you about, uh, that pain also significantly dropped. So there's something happening that is quite intriguing. But the interesting thing is that 
we also applied it in a non-invasive way. Two electrodes just on the back of your head, we stimulated that nerve, and we were able to show or replicate our findings in a non-invasive way. And this is, of course, very interesting. And this got me thinking, going back to the idea that electrical stimulation is activating those peripheral nerves, could it be something in it for memory? So typically the explanation for reducing pain is that, and C2 and C3 is referring to the occipital nerve, is actually there's a pathway going to the uh, uh, trigeminal uh, cervical complex, going up to the thalamus and the cortex, but it's also activating the pregenital anterior cingulate cortex going down to the periactual gray and uh, uh, the ventotegmental area and the medulla. And this is a descending pathway. And this is explanation why it works for pain. So basically, you have uh, ascending uh, nociceptive pathways. These are uh, nerves that send information to your brain about uh, the pain signal. But there's also basically a brake system that tells that the brain is signaling down to the area where you have pain to say, okay, this is not relevant, just ignore that pain. And it seems that by occipital nerve stimulation, you're activating that descending pathway, and that's the explanation why people did have less pain. Now, I continue to dig into the literature, and in the 80s, there was some uh, research that showed that great occipital nerve is connecting to the nucleus tractus solitaris. And I still remember reading that paper because that was really important. And why is that important? The nucleus tractus solitaris is connecting to another area that is the uh, holy grail for uh, memory. The nucleus tractus solitaris that is connected to you, uh, to the great occipital nerve, is connected to the locus ceruleus. And probably you already heard talks about the locus ceruleus, but the locus ceruleus is an area, is a brain nuclei, very deep in the brain, that releases norepinephrine, that signals throughout the brain. It's activated when you're aroused, when you're under stress, this area is, is activated. But it also plays an important role in memory. What we know is that uh, noradrenaline or norepinephrine, it's basically the same thing, uh, that it's important and inducing long-term potentiation in the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is basically the seat of where all memory is sitting. We also know that norepinephrine is send, or the locus ceruleus is sending norepinephrine to the amygdala and that it helps with stress-induced memory enhancement. Something that was very stressful, you will remember forever almost, because it was in a stressful situation, and that's probably because the locus ceruleus norepinephrine pathway. We also know that the locus ceruleus is essential for maintaining cognitive functioning and for the aging brain. And we know that we see changes in the locus ceruleus typically as one of the early changes that you could see in people with amnestic mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer disease. Noradrenaline is also neuro uh, protective and plays a key role in mediating cognitive reserve. There was a paper that was published in 2013 by Ian Robertson that was really an important, that was a game changer in looking at the locus ceruleus. So if we could activate that locus ceruleus norepinephrine pathway, maybe we can modify um, memory. So the first question was, is occipital nerve stimulation activating the locus ceruleus norepinephrine pathway? So we actually did it step by step, and that was my first question. Can we activate that pathway via occipital nerve stimulation? Now in humans, it's not always that easy to measure acti uh, activity at a molecular level, at a chemical level in humans. Typically you do it in animals, but I prefer to do it in humans because the ultimate goal is actually to, to improve uh, cognitive function in humans. And there's different proxies that we can use to actually, uh, to actually measure if we activate the locus ceruleus norepinephrine pathway. One way is to look at pupil dilations. And we know that your pupil dilate 
when there's LC activity. Another way, don't know what happened, is by collecting saliva. So if you have activity in the locus cerebellus, there will be the release of an enzyme which is called uh, alpha amylase uh, in your saliva. That is an indication for increased norepinephrine activity. Another way of looking into it is, is by using an all ball paradigm uh, using electrophys, and that's an indication also for, of LC activity. So what we've done is we measured, we used all these measures before we stimulated the greater occipital, occipital nerve and after occipital nerve. So this is what our setup. It's very basic, so you basically have two electrodes, the back of your head that are connected to a device that is sending electrical pulses, pulses to those uh, to the greater occipital nerve. Well, if we looked at uh, the pupil size, the pupil size was say, uh, changing in the active group and the pupils were getting larger uh, after stimulation in comparison to before stimulation, but only for the active group. For the sham group, it was the other way around. If we looked at alpha amylase, what we saw was that before so here you can see that during stimulation and after stimulation, there were higher levels of alpha amylase in comparison to a control group, indicating that there is release of norepinephrine. There was also a correlation between uh, pupil size and alpha amylase, indicating that these two, those two are measured to, uh, are basically going together, suggesting that activation in the locus cerebellus goes together with the release of norepinephrine. We also did an EEG study. We used a specific paradigm, an all ball paradigm, uh, where we looked at a specific electrode, B3, where we know that if you show activity over there, that goes together with locus cerebellus activity. So we, compared, we had an active group and a sham group, and we compared those two, and we saw changes in that area, and that actually, that after stimulation, there was more activity uh, in that specific area in comparison to a control group, indicating again that we're activating that uh, brain nuclei, the locus cerebellus. There's also a correlation between the release of alpha amylase, pupil size, and the amplitude that we could pick up from that EEG, confirming the idea that there's a correlation between activation of the locus cerebellus and norepinephrine when we're stimulate, when we're using electrical stimulation. So then the next question was, well, is occipital nerve stimulation modulating hippocampus, the hippocampus through the locus cerebellus norepinephrine pathway? We really want to go into the hippocampus because the hippocampus is where memories are stored. So that was the holy grail for us. We really wanted to get to the hippocampus. So the question was, well, we know that we can activate that locus cerebellus norepinephrine pathway, and there is literature that shows that there are structural connections between the nucleus tractus solitaris up to the locus cerebellus, up to the amygdala and the hippocampus. So the question is, are we stimulating, if we're stimulating that great occipital nerve, are we activating that pathway and do we see activity changes in the hippocampus and the amygdala? So again, we used electrophys and rest state fMRI. And if we look at the rest state activity, so this was done a uh, comparison between the active group after stimulation and the sham group, we saw that in the active group there was increased gamma activity in the medial temporal lobe and that there was nesting between theta and gamma activity for the active group in comparison to the sham group. Now, both neural oscillations, the theta and the gamma neural oscillation, are an index for human memory encoded in the cortical hippocampal network. So it's again confirmation that we're activating probably that pathway. And we know that, that gamma rhythm uh, integrates perceptual and contextual, uh, contextual information of episodic representations and that the nesting, the interaction between the theta and the gamma is involved in memory representation. Well, that was the first guess, of course. But then we went to MRI. And of course, then we can really look at that specific area. So when we look at activity in uh, that specific area, in the hippocampus, 
and uh, the amygdala, what we saw was that after stimulation, or actually during stimulation, we see that there was increased activity in the hippocampus, in the right hippocampus, in comparison to sham group, and also in the right amygdala in comparison to the sham group. When we then did a whole brain analysis, what we saw was that during stimulation, we see brain activity changes in the dorsal anterior sphincter cortex and the temporal parietal junction, and those areas has been associated with attention. But after stimulation, immediately after we stimulated the participants, we saw changes in the hippocampus. We continued to do our analysis, and we did what is called a roy to roy analysis. We looked at the locus ceruleus and those areas that we were hoping to see activity changes. So we looked at the amygdala and the hippocampus, and indeed, during stimulation, we saw that uh, there was increased connectivity, increased communication between the locus ceruleus and the hippocampus, and between the locus ceruleus and the amygdala for the active group in comparison to the sham group. And the active group is the people that actually got the stimulation, the sham group thought they got it, but we mimicked the sensation, but they actually didn't get it. After stimulation, what we saw was again that there was increased communication between the locus ceruleus and the hippocampus, but not in the amygdala. But it's confirming the idea that locus ceruleus or that greater occipital nerve stimulation is activating a specific pathway going via the locus ceruleus up to the hippocampus. Now, we know that we can reach to a brain area that is really important for memory, and we know that hippocampus is really, in people with Alzheimer's disease, uh, uh, is atrophized. So we see that it's basically de 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 uh, degrading. So it's really very intriguing that we can get through that via occipital nerve stimulation. So the next question is then, is occipital nerve stimulation enhancing memory? because that's what we were hoping to do. So we set up a first experiment. In the first experiment, it's what we call a phase name association task. It's a very basic task. It's uh, used a lot in the MRI because it's so basic. And then there's two steps. It's the encoding phase where we show a phase with a certain name. So this is Douglas, this is Amber. And to make sure that people pay attention, we ask them, do you see a male or a female? Sure, we don't care what the answer is, but just to be sure that they pay attention to the question. So during that encoding phase, we were stimulating the greater occipital nerve. So while they were learning those phases, we were stimulating the greater occipital nerve. Then we waited for 10 minutes, and then we showed those phases again. During the retrieval phase, we were not stimulating only during this phase. So during this retrieval test phase, we showed, again, faces, but we showed half of the faces were new faces that they hadn't seen before. Half of the faces were faces that they saw during the encoding phase. And we asked them, is this an old or a new face? So in this case, you would say, it's an old face. I have seen this before. And then if, we, if they answered, this is an old face, we ask them, what is the name of that person? Is it Daisy, Amber, Lily, or Grace? So these are the results of the experiment. This is the faces, these are the names. So what we saw is that the people that got active stimulation in comparison to the people that got sham stimulation, the active group was able to remember more old faces. So they recognized more uh, or they were more familiar with faces that they have seen before in comparison to a sham group. For the new faces, there was no difference. For the names, name recognition, the people that got occipital nerve stimulation were better at remembering the names in comparison to a sham group. Now, for people that are familiar with the, the stats, it was barely significant. So we were lucky, to be honest. So it was not, the, the data are not that convincing for scientists. But of course, this is, a, this is a recognition task. So recognition task is typically an easier task. Keep also in mind 
that this is done in college students. So you would assume that they're already at the peak of their performance. They have to study a lot, they train their brain constantly, at least that's what we're hoping they're doing. So it might be that this task is not challenging enough for them. So we start digging into literature and try to look for an experiment where they actually have to do recall and not just pure recognition. And there's one interesting study uh, published by Rudiger, Rudiger's group, it's called a word association task, where people have to learn Swahili. So what happens is we show Swahili words and the English translation of uh, that Swahili word. There's 75 words, we show them all the Swahili words, uh, then there's 30 seconds of rest, and then we basically give them the Swahili word and we ask them, well, give the English translation for that Swahili word. We do, we do this four times in a row. Now, the tricky thing is that in block one, you get all the 75 words, and then we test you for the 75 words. And the second block, we again present you all the 75 words, but we only test you for the words that you did not remember in the first block. So for example, in the first block, when you were tested, you remember 15 out of the 70 words. In the second block, we would only test you for those 60 words that you were not able to remember. Now, what is interesting and what Rudiger showed is actually that if you learn it in that specific way, it's actually a lot harder to, uh, to build up memories. So the best way to uh, learn things is actually you learn all the information and you always test, test yourself for all the information, not just for the new information. That's where it really sticks, uh, that information. But of course, we wanted to make it more challenging because we were working with college students, so we wanted to make it a little bit harder. So we uh, used a design where we only test them for the Swahili hertz that they did not remember in the previous block. There were four blocks. We were only stimulating during the study phase and then tested them uh, four times for the Swahili hertz. But actually, we were not really interested at day one. We tested them again seven days later Remember, we were only stimulating them during the study phase at day one. They came back seven days later, and then again, we present them the 75 Swahili words, and we ask them, what is the English translation for it? So we had one group that uh, we were stimulating the occipital nerve uh, actively, and there was uh, one group that also got the electrodes in place. They got a little bit of the sensation but it was actually sham because we tapered down the current and we were not stimulating the great occipital nerve. At day one, when they were learning it for the four blocks, and this is cumulative, there was no significant difference between the two groups. They were learning it at the same rate. They were learning the same amount of words uh, or the English translation of the Swahili words. But then we asked them to come back seven days later. So they were stimulated only during day one, not during day seven. And then we did the exact same thing. We gave them the 75 Swahili words and we asked them what is the English translation for the Swahili words. The people that got the real or the active occipital nerve stimulation did actually better than the sham group, indicating that we're indeed manipulating memory. So this was quite intriguing and we were very happy about it. We also looked at alpha amylase. Uh, we also did electrophys, and we saw a correlation between how many words they were able to remember at day seven with alpha amylase changes at day one. And there was a correlation between those two. Small correlation, but there was a correlation. We also did electrophys data, and we saw increased uh, gamma power, so the change that we pick up before stimulation and immediately after stimulation, that correlated with how many words they were able to remember and remember that gamma power is associated with memory representation. This was just one experiment. We were very happy about it, but still a little bit critical. What if we do this in elderly? What if we do this in a group that is above 65? Can we replicate our results? And we even pushed it a little bit more. Same task, again, we asked people to learn Swahili but we pushed it a little bit, 
we tested them at the, uh, seven days after they learned the task and 28 days after they learned the task. Intriguing, we made it a little bit smaller. We took them because, unfortunately, it took them a little bit longer to type in the words. So we had to reduce the experiment a little bit. So we only had three blocks instead of four blocks. And we only had 50 words that they have to learn. <laughs> so there was no difference between the active group and the sham group during learning uh, that information. But then seven days later, what we saw was that the people that got active stimulation remember a lot more words than the control group, the sham group. 28 days later, the group that got active still remembered more words than the sham group. And remember, we're only stimulated during their, uh, day one, okay? So again, confirmation that we're manipulating memory and that we're actually enhancing uh, memory in an older group, which was quite encouraging. We also looked if there was an association, how many words do you remember at day seven? And does it correlate with how many words you remember at day 28? And for the people that got active stimulation, there was a strong correlation. For the people that were in the sham group, there was no correlation at all. If you look at the data, you also see that both groups still forget things. So you still see that they remember more words at day seven than at day 28, okay? But if you compare active versus sham, the active group did better. Well, as a scientist, we need to be sure if we're really activating that specific nerve or that it could be just more than a general effect or a sensation effect that people feel something that we're not aware of that is different between the active group and the sham group. And because of that, it's basically a big placebo effect. It's just a sensation that creates. Uh, they're more alert, and that's why they remember uh, more. So we did an experiment where we had different setups. This is the original setup. We flipped the electrodes. The, the two electrodes have a specific color, red and blue. We just flipped it. You never know. Then we have a group where we stimulate. We say that C5 and C6, but it's basically just we're stimulating the shoulders. And there's a group where we're stimulating. We say it's a trigeminal nerve. It's probably just the cheeks that we're stimulating. Again, the exact same task. They had to learn Swahili. At day one, there was no difference between the groups in how many words they were able to remember. But then we tested them seven days later. And only the two groups where we stimulated the greater occipital nerve we saw an improvement in comparison to the two control groups. So this was already encouraging that it's a more specific effect. It's not just sending electricity to the brain that helps, but still we were critical because it could be that we're stimulating another nerve that we're not aware of that might play an important role. So, and this is work in collaboration with Krista McIntyre, who's also working here at UT Dallas. We implanted animals. We implanted rats, and we actually have a cuff electrode. It's basically an electrode wrapped around that nerve. So you know that we're only stimulating that specific nerve. In our case, the occipital nerve. Of course, it's a little bit more difficult for animals to learn Swahili words. So we had to be a little bit more creative and coming up with a different task. And the first task was an object recognition task. So animals typically, this is a training phase, uh, they're in a cage, and those animals just like to explore, and we show them two objects. There were more objects, of course, but in this case, just two objects. And they uh, like to approach those objects, sniff a little bit around these objects, uh, and that's it. And then 24 hours later, we put them in the same cage, and typically, if they remember the object that they have seen 24 hours uh, before, they're going to sniff a lot more the new object than the old object. And that's an indication that they recognize those objects. So we have one group, so we trained all those animals during the training phase. One group got active stimulation of the great occipital nerve. One group was in the sham condition, uh, was implanted, but didn't get the stimulation. Intriguing to see was that during learning, the learning phase or the training phase, the acquisition of that task, 
there was no difference between the two groups. This was the time that we were stimulating. But then we tested them 24 hours later and the active group was actually sniffing a lot more those new objects than the control group, indicating that they remembered those objects that they seen 24 hours before um, in comparison to the sham group. Quite intriguing. We did another experiment in animals, and that's inhibitory avoidance. So animals, those rats, like to sit in the dark. When this is basically two chambers, they're put in a chamber with a lot of light, and they like to go into that dark space, in the dark room. But once they're in the dark room, they get a food shock. So it's not a very pleasant experience. So again, we trained those animals. One group of animals uh, got greater occipital nerve stimulation. The other group got sham stimulation. And then we tested them 24 hours later. And again, what we were seeing is that during the training phase, there was no difference between the group that got uh, the active group and the sham group. Both animals were going the same rate into that dark room. But then 24 hours later, it took a lot longer for those animals that got C2 stimulation to go into that dark room than the control group. Again, suggesting that they remember that it's not a smart idea to go into that dark room because they're probably going to get a food shock. And this is an indication that we're really activating that specific nerve and that that specific nerve is really important in uh, inducing new memories. We did a final test where we sedated the great occipital nerve. So we have Emla cream, it's, you can buy it over the comb, it's basically lidocaine where you can sedate that nerve a little bit. So we had one group where we sedated the nerve, another group that we basically used a fake cream, a hand cream. Um, did the same experiment, tested them seven days later, there was no difference. Uh, there was a difference between the group that uh, got the anesthetic and the people that did not get the anesthesia. Suggesting that again, we have a peripheral effect that induces those memory effects. No. at what stage are we generating an effect during the formation of uh, those memories? So if we look into the literature, we can divide it into three big uh, chunks of memory processing. We have the encoding phase, where we're acquiring the information. We have the consolidation phase, where we're actually storing the information, and the retrieval phase. So we really wanted to understand where exactly is it where we're intervening. So. The intriguing thing is, again, we did the same experiment, but the only difference is that one group got stimulation of the greater occipital nerve during training, and one group immediately after the training, and then we had also a sham group. Again, there was no difference during the learning, but then seven days later, what we saw was that it doesn't really matter if you stimulate during the training or immediately after the training, you get the same effect they did better than uh, the sham group. So this is suggesting that actually we're probably not interfering with acquiring the information because they all learn at the same rate. There's no difference between the group, but it's more during the consolidation where you really store that information. One comment was that, well, maybe the people that got the stimulation, they sleep better than the people that did not get stimulation, but there was no uh, correlation between how many words they were able to recall and the sleep quality. So that was not the case. We also stimulated not during learning of the task, but the testing phase of the task, and we did not see an effect, suggesting that it's not during the retrieval of the information that we're doing something. So it suggests that we're really intervening during uh, the consolidation. Now, if we talk about consolidation, there's two types of consolidation. We have synaptic consolidation, which is basically the short, sh short term changes that you induce in the brain, and then you have systems consolidation. A systems consolidation can take hours, days, weeks, months, years, actually. And there's differences in the brain and what's happening. 
So we wanted to know, is it during synaptic consolidation or during system consolidation? Remember, synaptic consolidation is really short term where the, hippocamp uh, the hippocampus plays an essential role. Systems consolidation, systems consolidation the hippocampus uh, plays less of a role, uh, people claim. There's still a lot of controversy about this topic, uh, but that's a general idea. So we wanted to know, is it during synaptic consolidation, so immediately after the learned task, or is it more a long-term effect that we're generating over days, uh, then it would be more systems consolidation. So systems consolidation is actually something that you do during sleep. That's why sleep is so important. So sleep really helps you to store information. So we had two groups. We had one group that we tested in the evening while well, they learned the task. It was again the same word association task, Swahili task. We asked them, uh, we asked them to learn the task at eight o'clock in the evening. There was another group that was tested in the morning. So we test, uh, sorry, that was uh, trained in the morning at eight o'clock in the morning, and then 12 hours later they came back. So the people that were learning the task at eight o'clock in the evening were tested the next, next morning, and then uh, the group that well, learned the task in the morning were tested that same day in the evening, and there was no difference between the two groups in how many words they were able to remember, suggesting that it's not saying that sleep is not important in remembering things, but that occipital nerve stimulation is not really interfering properly with systems consolidation. So it seems that it needs to be synaptic consolidation. Now, I'll quickly go over this slide. Uh, it's more a molecular neuroscience, but the basic idea is that for synaptic uh, consolidation is that when you learn something, in your neurons there will be tags and these tags need to be captured. And only if they're captured, you will induce long-term potentiation. You will actually induce long-term storage of that information. Now, if there's a strong sensation that you get, there's no problem. But when a weak sensation, when you have to learn things, it's most of the time not that interesting or not that uh, life-changing, that's why, where you have a weak sensation, you have these tags but most of the time they're not captured, and that's why you forget if I will tell you my phone number, probably in an hour you do not remember it anymore. If I would ask you in 20 seconds after I gave you my phone number, you will probably be able to remember. So that means that you have these tags, but they're not captured. Only when those tags are captured, you get LTP, which is basically the synaptic process to induce memory storage. So we think that occipital nerve stimulation is playing a role in that. Now, this is the, the previous slide was really the molecular side of it, but you also have a behavioral component to it, and which is called behavioral tagging. So typically, when I'm telling you something, like for instance my phone number, you will store it in short-term memory, but then it fades, and you will not be able to remember it, and it will not be stored in long-term memory. But if you have a weak event, my phone number, and let's say that all of a sudden a line is crossing through the room, you will be able to remember my phone number for the rest of your life. Why is that? There's a novel event, and novelty is activated, activated by your locus ceruleus. So you get alert, you get aroused, and people see it. The example that they're giving is you're studying in the library for your exam, and all of a sudden someone fell from the stair, you will remember very well that thing that you'll, those things that you learned immediately before actually that person fell from the stairs. That's another example that they're giving. So is it that occipital nerve stimulation is doing that? So a way to test that, there's uh, an experiment done by Elizabeth Phelps' group uh, that was published in Nature a couple of years ago where people had to learn items that were, can be classified in two uh, categories, tools and animals. So they learned a whole bunch of animals and tools, then they waited for half an hour, and then again they showed uh, different items that belong to the same category, but only for one specific category, every time that they were showing, for example, tools, they also got an electroshock. 
Then half an hour later, again, other items uh, were shown from the same two categories, and then they were tested 24 hours later. And what they saw was that for those items were, or the, the category where every time you basically get a, an electroshock, you were better at remembering those items in comparison to the other category, but not only those during, uh, those items that you got the electroshocks for, but also half an hour before and half an hour later, the items of that same category of where you got the uh, electroshocks, you were better at remembering, and that's what we call behavioral tagging. Now, I didn't want to give, well, I was already sending electrical uh, stimulation to the brain, which is, by the way, not painful, but I didn't want to do, in addition, another electroshock uh, uh, to test this experiment, so we set up a different design. So, again, there were two tasks. You're already familiar with the Swahili task, and we had a second memory task, which is an object location task. A specific object is assigned to a specific location. I need to learn where the object is located, okay? Very similar to the design as for the Swahili words, so there was the, uh, three blocks for learning Swahili task, there were three blocks for the study time, uh, for the memory task number two. And then seven days later, we test then how many Swahili words they were able to remember and also the location of those objects. So they basically had to, uh, with the mouse, indicate where that object needs to be, okay? So this is the learning at day one. So we stimulated them in one group during the memory task, the spatial navigation task. The memory task number one was a Swahili task. There was no difference between the people that got active stimulation and sham stimulation, but seven days later, they do, the people that got occipital nerve stimulation were doing better for both the second task, where they got the stimulation for at day one, as well as the first memory task. So it indicates that there's a retroactive strengthening of memories that we're inducing. We did the same thing, but now we were stimulating during the first task. And again, we see the same effect. There was a proactive strengthening of memories. So although we were stimulating for the first task, also there was a benefit for the second task where they did not get the stimulation. Suggesting that indeed there is something like behavioral tagging going on. We pushed it a little bit more. That's one of my final slides. I've pushed it a little bit more. We uh, made it a little bit more complicated. In addition of learning Swahili, we now also expect the participants to learn Japanese words. The same words, but of course it could interfere and it makes it a little bit more complicated. So there's two memory tasks. The one is Swahili task, the other one is the, me uh, the second memory task. They learn Japanese. We switch it around, so some people first had Japanese, then the Swahili task, other people had first Swahili task. I think we're only stimulating during learning, not during testing, and then we tested them seven days later. Uh, what we, we see is that during the first day, there was no difference between the active and the sham group for memory task one and memory task two. But seven days later, we tested them again, see how many Swahili words they were they remembered and how many Japanese words they were remembering. What we see in the sham group is actually that they do a lot better for the first task than for the second task. And that's what we call the interference task. You're learning something and then the second task is interfering with the first task and that's why it's so hard to remember uh, newer information. But for the active group, there was no interference effect anymore. And actually they were doing a lot better than the sham group. So again, confidence that behavioral tagging plays a role. Is it the final evidence? Probably not, but it's giving us a flavor of what we're doing and it's suggesting that we're really manipulating synaptic consolidation. So, in summary, electrical transcranial electrical stimulation oh, uh, actually has a transcutaneous effect, so we're probably only stimulating the brain a little bit, but most of the effect is generated to peripheral nerves. 
we're activating, if we're stimulating the great oxygen nerve, we're activating specific pathway going from the lucus tractus uh, solitaris to the locus cereus up to the hippocampus. We're able to modulate memory. And it's probably the mechanism is not during the encoding, f encoding of the inf information or the acquiring of the information, but during consolidation and more precisely, immediately after the synaptic consolidation uh, uh, is where we have an impact. So what is the future? So we've done all the basic science and actually now we're doing a clinical trial doing the same thing in people with amnestic mild cognitive impairment and early AD. So hopefully we can replicate our results. That would be a major breakthrough, I think, if we can replicate this in, here in a, a patient population with, memory with a memory deficit. But we're also doing something else. So we just got funding from the EU, a large amount of uh, funding, because this was done in a non-invasive way, but maybe for people with amnestic mild cognitive impairment. And for AD, it makes more sense that they do not have to have set up that helmet and everything to stimulate, but that we have an electrode that we can inject. So no surgery, it's just an injection, and you get a wire electrode that's going to stimulate that nerve. That would make it a lot easier uh, to do it. So that's what we're working on in addition to doing the clinical trial. That was it. Thank you. All right, Sven, thank you. Excellent talk. Uh, we do have some time for questions, so let's, let's go ahead and start right over here. And remember to speak into the microphone. Okay, hi. Nice presentation. Um, would it be too simple to conclude that there was about a 10 to 15 percent improvement in memory on those that were stimulated as compared to those that weren't? Is that about right? Yeah. Okay. One important thing, right. this was done in college students. So keep in mind that they're at the peak of their performance. So it could be in the patient population, and we don't know, that you get that the window of improvement is a lot better because they would perform a lot worse than those, I mean, those college students. So but we don't know yet, but right. that's the assumption. But didn't you also do a test of people over 65? Yeah, but they, they didn't have any cognitive decline. They were very healthy. So we're really looking into now people with cognitive decline where there's more room for improvement. So in college students, it's what we call a ceiling effect. I mean, because they're already at the peak of their performance, we really have to challenge and make it even harder for them uh, to learn the task, otherwise they probably would already have 100%, so that's why. I don't remember by what it was. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 well, I didn't have, to, uh, I didn't have uh, occipital nerve stimulation during my presentation, that's why I'm not able to remember it. <laughs> All right, thank you. Where can one find an occipital nerve stimulator and how much does it cost? Okay. <laughs> cool question. Uh, at this point, it's not on the market. So we're still testing it. And if we see improvement, then uh, it will be available. TENS unit is a little bit different in how it works. I mean, over-the-counter TENS devices. I'm also for the transcranial electrostimulation devices. You can already buy it on Amazon. This, uh, I mean, gamers are really fond of that because they think that they can improve their gaming skills. We tested some of these devices in compar comparison to the devices that we use in the lab. The price is a little bit different, so it's 750 for a device that they sell on Amazon. The device that we use is 10,000. So there is a little bit of a difference, and we tested and we measured, and the current is not that reliable and so on, so yeah. That's also why, probably why you can sell it over the counter. So. Thank you, very interesting presentation. Can you um, uh, just kind of elucidate a bit on how uh, sleep does or does not impact uh, 
memory and memory recall. Okay, so it's, it's not part of my presentation, but we know that sleep is so, so, so important for memory. So we know just uh, for people, uh, we see that you have these modifiable risk factors. So healthy diet, food really has an impact on your brain health. So that's really important. And it's already shown in several studies that that plays an important role. Specifically for memory, we know that, so sometimes students, they waited too long before studying and then they study the whole night. The recommendation is do not do that. Basically have a good night of sleep. You will remember a lot more. So typically when people have a blackout, it's because they didn't have any sleep and then yeah, they fell for their exam because yeah, they, they acquired the information, but it's not really stored that information. No, we don't see, so it's, it's earlier. We see that it's what is called synaptic consolidation where we really have an impact. So because w one of the, qu the questions that I had when I was presenting my results, well, maybe all that stuff about occipital nerve stimulation is not really doing anything for memory. It's just improving your sleep. And because you sleep better, you remember better. So that's why we tested it. So, but it's possible that we can modify sleep because locus release is also really important in sleep. But of course, these, these people didn't have any sleep problems, so we didn't test that. There is, however, now that I'm thinking of, in the people with fibromyalgia, where they got an implant, their sleep was a lot better, actually, their sleep quality was, yeah, yeah. So then the question is, is it because they have less pain, or is it actually sleep that we're modifying? So that's something that we do not know, and that's very hard to disentangle. Did you do a comparison uh, which would not be as intrusive as using a probe such as um, exercise, which release, releases endorphins. Did, did you do anything like that, this, what the comparisons would be? Uh, no, we didn't make a comparison. We know that exercise is, again, one of these modifiable risk factors and that it really has an impact on brain health. So we know that. Uh, we didn't do a direct comparison between uh, the two. We have to be a little bit careful because there's, there's some study. Actually, a colleague of mine, mine did a study, Brian Lawler, did a study in people with AD where they exercised and they didn't see a lot of improvement in those. But of course, maybe it was already too late. So the sooner that you do that, the better maybe. And it's more neuroprotective if you do that already before there's any issues. So. Ms. Fan, thank you very much. Very elegant, all those steps through. I think what's fascinating is when I think about how much m money we pay for medications when we do think we have memory problems and even supplements versus real medications, and we get zero benefit on memory, and yet people don't, 10% is really a, a very high level. I'm thinking about if we were to go to a party where we're meeting a lot of new people and everyone had these occipital lobe, wouldn't it be fun? Because the number one thing people want is, I can't remember anyone's name anymore. So that, it would be, thank you for this. And I'm thinking about the neuroplasticity of being tied to different types of cognitive training, like we do the smart training and doing this as they learn the tactical strategies. Are you ready to do that study with me? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, we do have an online question uh, regarding the um, selection of the stimulation parameters. So maybe if you could comment a little bit on how how you determine the duration of stimulation and like the frequency, you know, mm -hmm. maybe the mm -hmm. delay between learning and interim stimulation. And if you think that there's an important uh, timing element there. Yeah. Um, so we're still looking into it. We did one experiment last year when we, and there we stimulated only for, I think, two and a half minutes. And we didn't see an effect, unfortunately. We saw an opposite effect. Actually, the sham group was doing better <laughs> than uh, uh, the active group. I think I asked that student 20 times, are you sure that you didn't flip the groups? But 
that was not the case. So, but we're not sure how long we have to stimulate. Uh, if you really want to translate it into a therapy, uh, how many times you have to stimulate. So we know from the clinic, not related to memory deficit, but for pain and for uh, tinnitus and so on, that typically you have to do it twice, uh, two times a week for 10 weeks and then taper it down and then you see uh, a long-term benefit. Okay, we are at time. So uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Lifelong brain health is our shared mission. Um, we'll thank Sven Vanesta for all of his insights. Um, thank you, Sven. And I'll conclude by mentioning the, um, the power of research truly lies in how we use it to make the world a better place. So we've launched a large scale landmark study called the Brain Health Project, which will help people everywhere get proactive about their brain health. If you'd like to learn more about it, go ahead and sc scan the QR code or visit thebrainhealthproject.org. And uh, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we'll be back again on November 4th, where we have Elena Katok talking about um, behavioral economics. So we'll look forward to seeing you then.